Is question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. When inflation is rising and living standards are under a lot of pressure, it is not right to increase income tax for those who are on the basic rate. Does the First Minister agree with that statement? First Minister. Well, the Finance Secretary, of course, will set out the details of the budget later this afternoon. Uh, that will cover both our tax proposals and our spending proposals. We will seek uh, to protect our vital public services from the cuts being imposed by the Tories. We will make sure we protect those on low and middle incomes. And of course, we will invest in business and the economy. And I can tell the Chamber uh, today that 70% uh, of taxpayers in Scotland, 83% uh, of all adults in Scotland will pay no more income tax after this budget than they do now. Ruth Davidson. We do look forward to the details of that later on, but I was asking. But I'm not quite sure, and I can tell by the face, that that flourish will quite have the result that it was looking for. Because the reason I asked the question in the statement at the beginning was because those were the direct words of the First Minister herself just this year in May. And I wasn't asking her to reveal her budget, although we're pleased for any details that are forthcoming. But what I was asking her was whether she agreed with herself that all people who currently only pay the basic rate of income tax, which is 2.2 million people in this country, shouldn't have to pay more, because that was the promise she made. And just now, hasn't she just told at least some of them that she's breaking that promise? First Minister. I would encourage Ruth Davidson to listen very carefully uh, to the announcements that will be made in just a couple of hours' time by the Finance uh, Secretary. Uh, in the budget, of course, we will be balancing a number uh, of uh, different priorities. Uh, of course, uh, as the opposition are fond of telling me, we are a minority government. We require to build consensus around our budget proposals. But, of course, we also have to deal with one of the most challenging economic and fiscal contexts that any government in the lifetime of this parliament has ever faced. As uh, we heard confirmed indeed just uh, this morning on the radio by the Fraser of Allender Institute, our day-to-day -day spending is being cut in real terms by more than 200 million pounds in real terms next year. Over the next two years, Tory cuts will take £500 million in real terms out of the spending this Parliament has available for our nurses, for our doctors, for our teachers and for our police officers. As a bit rich in light of that for the Tories to come to this chamber and lecture anybody about tax and public spending. On top of that, of course, as we found out uh, just last week, every household across not just Scotland, but the UK will be facing a bill of £1,400 to pay for the Tories' Brexit obsession. The bill just to rip the UK and, of course, Scotland against our will uh, out of the European Union. So in light of all of that, the proposals we put forward this afternoon will be responsible, they will be balanced, they will protect our vital public services from Tory cuts, they will protect the majority of taxpayers and they will invest in business and the economy and in all of that they will stand in stark contrast to anything the Tories are doing. Yeah. Ruth Davidson. President Officer, the First Minister has just revealed that there will be tax cuts in this budget so perhaps the First Minister should listen to what Scotland's small businesses are saying about that. This week, the Federation of Small Business gave her a blunt warning. They revealed that three-fifths of Scotland's small businesses don't want any change in income taxes rates. They don't want them to go up. Two-thirds believe income tax increases would damage the economy. So we're not talking about multi-million pound corporations here. These are small and medium-sized firms that are the lifeblood of the economy and support 1.2 million Scottish jobs. And this First Minister has just told them there will be tax rises that they don't want. So who should we trust when we know that they're talking about when it comes to growing the economy? Scotland's small business owners, who are warning against the very tax rises the First Minister has just revealed, or the Finance Secretary that wants to push them up? First Minister. Well, I actually met with the Federation of Small Businesses just 
last week. And of course, one of the many things they said to me was how highly they value the small business bonus, yep. the most uh, generous yep. small business uh, rate scheme uh, anywhere in the UK. And I, I don't think I'm revealing too much. Uh, the finance secretary is starting to look at me uh, with that worried expression <laughs> in his face, but I don't think I'm revealing too much uh, when I say the small business bonus scheme will be protected in the budget this afternoon. Uh, that, of course, lifts 100,000 small businesses out of business rates altogether. Another way in which this budget will invest in business and in growing our economy. Uh, so I think there'll be a lot of interest to Ruth Davidson and to others when the Finance Secretary gets his feet uh, this afternoon to outline how this Scottish Government will protect people, the length and breadth of our country, from the cuts being imposed on us by Ruth Davidson's party. Ruth Davidson. Presenting well, officer, time and time again, ahead of elections, the SNP government make promises to people on tax. And it was only in May of this year that the First Minister was absolutely clear. It is not right, she said, for any person on the basic rate to pay more. That is 2.2 million people in this country that would be protected and she's just stood up and said that some of them are going to take a hit this is a simple matter of trust promises were made she's failed to meet them so how can scottish workers ever trust her again first minister well i suggest i suggest that ruth davidson listens carefully uh, to the budget this afternoon because when derek mckay stands up here and outlines his budget proposals then uh, much of what ruth davidson has been saying over the past weeks uh, will be seen to be complete and utter nonsense. Uh, we will set out fair, balanced, progressive budget proposals that protect our public services from more than £200 million in real terms of cuts being imposed by the Tories. Now, that is a fact. The Tories don't like hearing. So let me repeat it. Our spending is being cut uh, by more than £200 million in real terms next year. And the proposals we put forward this afternoon will set out how we protect our NHS, our education system and other vital public services uh, from that, while protecting the vast majority of taxpayers and also investing in business and the economy. Of course, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how bothered uh, Ruth Davidson really is by all of this. Because no sooner have the Tories slumped back into third place in Scottish politics than we have Ruth Davidson setting out her escape plan when <laughs> she plans to jump ship to Westminster. Thank you. Question. Okay, okay. Question number two. Order, please. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Thank you, presiding officer. Every time uh, we raise Scotland's housing crisis with this government, it spins out the same line. We will build 50,000 affordable homes and 35,000 homes for social rent by the end of this parliament. This week, new housing statistics revealed that in fact the government is way off course from meeting its targets. So can the first minister explain today how these vital homes will be built. First well, Minister. We have set a target and we will meet that target to build 50,000 affordable homes over the life of this parliament. Now, I know that Richard Leonard uh, wasn't in the last parliament, so he might not know this, but in the last parliament, we had a target of 35,000 affordable homes over the lifetime of the parliament. Uh, and over the course of that parliament, we had to listen uh, to Labour MSP after Labour MSP periodically tell us that we had no chance of meeting that target. Well, you know what? We met that target in the last parliament and we will meet the new target in this parliament. And of course, the finance secretary uh, will set out funding plans to support that target in his budget this afternoon. Uh, and the announcement he makes uh, in this budget, of course, will be part of an overall funding commitment uh, of £3 billion over this parliament to build 50,000 affordable homes. Uh, that's the record of this government. Of course, uh, Richard Leonard is the latest leader of the party that, when it was last in office, managed to build the grand total of six council houses. Richard Leonard. 
Yeah, I seem, to, um, I, I, seem, I seem to recall there was a redefinition of the target in the last session of the Scottish Parliament. The, sh the, sh the, shortage, the shortage of affordable housing is a key cause of homelessness. So we should be thankful for the important work being done by the Homelessness Prevention and Strategy Group, which has fought for government funding to help rough sleepers this winter. But as long as the supply of affordable housing is stalling, and as long as this government cuts, cuts local authority budgets, yep. which provide... <laughs> budgets which provide housing support, which provide temporary accommodation, which provide funding for women's aid and refuges, the strategy group is, is fighting an uphill battle to prevent homelessness. And listen to the director of Shelter Scotland, Graham Brown, who earlier this week said, and I quote, some people think homelessness in Scotland is getting better and can be fixed overnight. Sadly, over the last year, things got worse. Does the First Minister agree with the director of Shelter Scotland that last year things got worse? First Minister. This government is increasing funding for affordable housing and as I said over this parliament will invest three billion pounds, a record sum, to deliver 50,000 affordable homes and it's exactly because I am, like uh, Shelter, so concerned about the rise in uh, rough sleeping in particular that I announced in the programme for government the establishment of the homelessness strategy group yeah. that Richard Leonard has just yeah, yeah, spoken yeah. about. And of course, within uh, the first few weeks of that group being established, it had al uh, already made its first recommendations to help tackle rough sleeping uh, this winter. The government accepted all of those recommendations and provided additional funding to help meet those recommendations. And we will, uh, of course, consider uh, on a continuing basis any further recommendations that that group uh, brings forward. Of course, the reason rough sleeping uh, is increasing are the welfare cuts being yeah. imposed on Scotland by the Tory government. And I again appeal to Richard. You've got, you've got Labour MSPs right now shaking their heads at the notion that welfare cuts are leading to an increase in rough sleeping. That, frankly, is a fact. So I would again call on Richard Leonard to join with those of us on these benches in calling for the devolution of all welfare powers to this parliament so that we can put a stop to these cuts at source. Richard Leonard. Well, we'll see how committed you are to stopping these cuts this afternoon when you announce your budget. I want to, presiding officer, I want to share the experiences of a young woman in Edinburgh, Hanny Bell, who turned to the charity crisis for help. She's a recovering drug addict and a survivor of domestic abuse. She became homeless. And this week marked one whole year of being stuck in unsuitable temporary accommodation. In that accommodation she is faced with, and I quote her directly, people smoke coming through the cracks in the walls and floors, sleeping in sheets that look like Swiss cheese from cigarette burns, blood spatter on the walls of the bathroom from people injecting heroin. What Hannibal and thousands like her need is an affordable home and the local authority services that will get her back on her feet. Hannibal does not have a choice, but First Minister, you do. So this afternoon, will you choose? Will you choose to use the powers of the Parliament to invest in Lifeline Council services and end Scotland's homelessness crisis once and for all? First Minister. We'll see in just a a couple of hours, the choices that this government is making to protect Scotland from the, the cuts that are being imposed uh, by the Westminster Tory government. Uh, now, the experience he has just outlined uh, of Hannibal is completely uh, unacceptable. That is uh, why the homelessness strategy group that we have already spoken about has as its remit, not just tackling rough sleeping, uh, but tackling uh, the use and looking to improve the use of temporary 
accommodation. It's also why in the programme for government we announced an increase in funding to tackle alcohol uh, and uh, drug addiction and why we are establishing, of course, a £50 million fund to help uh, tackle homelessness and rough sleeping. So these and other measures will be outlined in our budget this afternoon. And when Richard Leonard does see the choices that we are making, uh, I hope he will stay consistent with what he has been saying in this chamber and back the choices that we are making in this budget yeah. because they are the right choices for the people of this country. Thank you. We have a, a couple of constituency supplementaries. The first from Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. The family of a 91-year-old constituent have asked me to raise their extremely distressing health and care issue, which has wider implications. The elderly deaf and blind woman who has a stoma bag was discharged from hospital with insufficient care, only one daily district nurse visit, and at times no assistance available via the home care alarm. And so on several occasions she suffered the indignity, distress and discomfort of a burst stoma bag with her family believing that her life's at risk. If this is happening to one elderly vulnerable person, many others will also be suffering as a result of funding cuts and lack of adequate stoma care. So can I ask the First Minister, does she think this is acceptable? And if not, what will she do about it? First Minister. Well, from uh, what Elaine Smith has just said, no, I don't think that is uh, at all acceptable. Uh, can I say to Elaine Smith, if she can provide uh, the details of her constituents' case to the Health Secretary this afternoon, the Health Secretary will immediately look into that uh, and uh, then, of course, correspond uh, with the member who can feed that back to her constituents. I hope she finds uh, that response helpful as a way of taking this forward. And Bob Doris. Uh, First Minister, a constituent of mine is close to securing a training placement with a commercial airline. However, due to being HIV positive, the Civil Aviation Authority will not issue the required medical certification, citing European Aviation Safety Agency rules. I understand a deviation from these rules can be permitted. If my constituents are in the USA, Canada, New Zealand or Australia, or indeed have contracted HIV as an existing commercial pilot, there would be no issues. Can I ask whether the First Minister agrees with me this situation amounts to discrimination? And can the Scottish Government make representations to the CAA to seek to end this injustice and therefore allow my constituent to pursue their dreams? First Minister. Well, I'm, I'm not aware of the full details of this case. However, I am very clear that any employment policies or regulations in this area must be based on the most up-to-date facts about HIV, not on outdated information or misconceptions. I do understand that the Civil Aviation Authority has already said that they support a rule change in this area uh, and are working with the European Aviation Safety Agency to reassess the regulation. Uh, I will write to the CAA to make clear my support for this rule change. Uh, we can all play a part in making life better for those living with HIV and we should all continue to work uh, to eradicate the stigma around the virus and tackle the false myths and prejudices that unfortunately still surround it. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, maybe at this time of year, everybody wants to unwrap the, their Christmas present a wee bit early and the budget is no different. But there are many, many thousands of people in Scotland who want to know if there's anything in store for them. And I'm talking about the people working to deliver our vital public services in every community in Scotland. They've seen their wages cut year after year in real terms, and they want to know whether their pay will again be cut this year or whether there is the hope of at least an inflation-based increase. Uh, does the First Minister agree with Graham Smith of the STUC, who has made the case not only for this budget, but for the longer term, that the pay settlement must begin the process of restoring the lost value in people's wages and that it must be fully funded by the Scottish Government across our public services. First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government has already committed to uh, lifting the 1% public sector pay cap. Indeed, we remain the only government in the UK that has made that commitment. Alongside the budget this afternoon, the Finance Secretary will also publish uh, the public sector pay policy, uh, which, of course, will include further details of the approach we will take. As I have said, Previously, we want to see uh, fair pay settlements for our public sector workers that do recognise the rising cost of living, uh, but also pay settlements that are uh, affordable as well. So that will be uh, what we set out this afternoon. And uh, I'm sure Patrick Harvey uh, will understand when uh, I say that he does have to wait just a little bit longer uh, to unwrap the full details. 
Patrick Harvey. Well, one area where we don't have to wait any longer, one thing that we know won't be in the budget this afternoon is a tax giveaway to the aviation industry. The SNP policy to halve and then scrap air departure tax was kicked down the road by just uh, at least one year, ostensibly for technical reasons, uh, and a consultation and economic assessment were planned. The results were published last week and they were so unhelpful to the government that I can almost sympathise. Can the First Minister confirm that the consultation responses were overwhelmingly hostile to the government's policy, showing 96% opposition when all the responses were counted. And can she explain why one of the central economic arguments that the bulk of the tax cut would benefit the wealthiest in society was entirely ignored by the economic assessment? First Minister. Well, Patrick Harvey and I have had exchanges on this in the Chamber in the past. Of course, we want to have balanced policies across the whole range uh, of policy areas, uh, policies that help to boost our economy as well as protect our public services, and that is the approach this government will take. Of course, uh, as Patrick Harvey uh, has said, this will not feature in the budget this afternoon, not <laughs> ostensibly for technical reasons, but uh, actually for technical reasons. We will continue to discuss these issues with the UK government and, of course, report back to this parliament in due course. There's a few more supplementaries. The first from Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last week I warned the government that the growing disparity in pay between Orkney Ferries crew and their counterparts in CalMac, who are funded directly by ministers, risked industrial action on Orkney's lifeline internal ferry services. This week the RMT has confirmed its members have now voted to take such action. The consequences for the island communities who uh, are utterly reliant on those services could be disastrous. So can I ask the First Minister, even at this 11th hour, to ensure that the, her Finance Secretary comes to the Chamber this afternoon with a budget that honours both his and his government's commitment, as well as the will of this Parliament, that delivers fair funding for Orkney and Shetland's internal ferry services? First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, of course, these are services that right now are run by uh, the councils, not by CalMac, not by uh, the Scottish Government. The Finance Secretary, of course, will continue to engage with these councils, as he has done before now, uh, about what the future might hold for these services. And, of course, we are open uh, to constructive uh, discussions in the future uh, on that. Of course, uh, Liam MacArthur and his colleagues uh, ask us to put uh, something like this into the budget but still refuse to say that they would back the budget even uh, if there was a provision such as this in it. So we will continue to have these discussions uh, and look to do the right thing by our island communities. Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, an investigation screened on BBC One this week showed how hundreds of tonnes of dead salmon are being shipped across Scotland in lorries leaking waste onto the roadside. Any farming system where over a quarter of the livestock are diseased and die before they reach the market has a massive problem, First Minister. So will the First Minister put in place a moratorium on fish farm expansion until this Parliament's Rural Economy and Environment Committees have included their inquiries into this sector? Minister. Well, I'm happy to ask the Environment Secretary to have discussions with the member uh, around this. I do understand uh, the concerns that people have about aspects of, of fish farming, uh, and I know that some of the revelations in the documentary add uh, to those concerns. Uh, I know these are issues of concern to the Environment Secretary, and she'd be happy to discuss them further with the member. And Daniel Johnson. Uh, an independent report detailed in today's newspapers uh, predicts that Scotland will need an additional uh, 500 classrooms by 2020 in our secondary schools. In South Edinburgh, this is no surprise, as despite two new secondary schools, local forecast show will be hundreds of places short within the next two to three years. So will today's budget commit the funds needed to build the extra classrooms that we need to meet the shortfall in South Edinburgh and across Scotland, given the increased capital at the Scottish Government's disposal? First Minister. Well, of course, it is for individual uh, local authorities to plan their education provision uh, based on their assessments uh, of need now and in the future. But can I point out to the member that since uh, we took office, since this government took office, more than uh, 700 uh, new or refurbished schools uh, are now in existence across uh, the country. We now have 86% uh, of young people learning in schools that are classed as in good or satisfactory condition, a, a considerable increase since we took office. So we will continue to discuss these issues on an ongoing uh, basis with councils because, of, of course, it is absolutely essential that we have the right education provision uh, where there are growing numbers of young people, and I know that Edinburgh is one uh, such case. Question number four, Christine Graham. 
Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government understands by the term regulatory alignment and what this means for commerce between Scotland and Northern Ireland. First Minister. Well, we are uh, seeking clarification from the UK Government on precisely what it means by regulatory alignment and what the impact uh, would be for Scotland. Uh, the Irish Government has been clear that it would facilitate free movement of people, goods and services across the border to Northern Ireland. On that basis, we would understand the agreement to create equivalent rules to those of the European single market. Uh, of course, if a differential deal is to be available to one part of the UK, it should also be available to others. It would be entirely wrong and unfair for Scotland to be placed at a competitive disadvantage, something we have made very clear to the UK Government. Christine Graham. Um, I thank the First Minister for her answer. According to a House of Commons report, UK ministers will have to import 19,000 EU rules and regulations on the statute book as a consequence of withdrawing from the European Union. So does regulatory alignment mean keeping most, if not all, 19,000 rules and regulations? And given that fundamental to leave campaign was cutting EU red tape, does the First Minister agree with me that this must be the biggest political fudge since records began? Indeed, speaking of fudge, will the fudge regulation still be in force and be one of those 19,000? First Minister. Well, I think knowing the Tories, the fudge regulations will definitely be safe uh, from, from a cull. Uh, Christine Graham talks about the claims made by the Leave campaign. Of course, it was the Leave campaign that told us that Brexit would deliver £350 million a week extra for the National still Health Service. Uh, we're still waiting for that. Uh, instead, we find out that we're going to face an almost £50 billion bill just to leave the European Union. Uh, of course, this issue of regulatory alignment is important. Uh, the legislative consequences of Brexit will uh, be a major undertaking. It's just one part of the, the massive effort that will need to be put in place uh, to get, uh, if the UK government continues on this course, a deal that will be worse uh, than the one we already have as part of uh, the EU. Now, if it is the case, that there is going to have to be alignment, then I think it uh, underlines even further the importance of the UK as a whole staying within the single market and the customs union. That would be the least damaging outcome for our economy. And I hope we see people in the House of Commons uh, coming together, as many of them did last night, to defeat the government on one particular amendment, although no Scottish Tory MPs were able to stand up to the government uh, last night. But I hope people will come together to keep the UK in the single market and in the customs union. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. The First Minister will, will be aware of the detail of the joint uh, report by the UK government and the EU last Friday, uh, saying that the basic principles of regulatory alignment must be upheld in all circumstances, irrespective of the nature of any future agreement. Can she tell us what her government's understanding is of the nature of that commitment, and in particular how that commitment uh, is liable in all circumstances to be enforced? First Minister. Well, Presumably, it is a commitment that the UK government will have to uh, abide by. And to hear David Davis at the weekend uh, almost trying to wriggle out of these commitments before the European Council had even had the opportunity to endorse them, I think says everything that needs to be said about the lack of trust that many on the European side of these negotiations have in the UK government. I think it's important uh, as these negotiations progress, as, as hopefully uh, they will, that people can trust the commitments that the UK government uh, give uh, on the evidence of the weekend, uh, that's perhaps <coughs> doubtful. But the most important thing here is that as these negotiations now proceed, they are in the interest of the economy and of people right across the UK. Uh, I wish we were staying in the European Union, but given the UK uh, is leaving the European Union, uh, I want to see a stay in the single market and the customs union, and I hope that is something that Labour at Westminster will eventually get round to supporting as well. Yeah. Question number five, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the First Minister for what reason the Scottish Survey of Literacy and Numeracy has been abandoned. First Minister. Well, SSLN has been replaced with more detailed and comprehensive information. SSLN gave us a national picture of children's progress in literacy and numeracy 
but did not provide any detailed information for local authorities and schools about the progress of individual children. The achievement of CFE levels data that we now publish is a much more comprehensive data collection. Uh, for the first time ever under CFE, it gives us the attainment levels of every child in Scotland at key stages in primary and secondary and provides detailed data at all levels of the system to help us identify what works in raising attainment and closing the attainment gap. Liz Smith. Uh, First Minister, every educational expert in the land is telling the Scottish Government that it needs to improve the quality of the data set, which can measure the progress in our schools. And they make the point that the Scottish Government's assertion that things will get better can only hold water if standardised assessment is actually standardised across the country and less dependent on the wide variations in teacher judgments across different local authorities. Does the First Minister not agree that parents have a right to expect the use of data that is reliable and respected for having a good track record and that the decision to abandon SSLN at this point in time in favour of experimental data was ill-advised. First Minister. Well, no, no, I don't uh, agree with that. SSLN was important, but I know as First Minister that the information it provided was nowhere near detailed enough to allow us to target actions uh, on improving performance and closing the attainment gap. The data that we now publish, as I've just said, is much more uh, comprehensive. I also disagree with Liz Smith about teacher uh, judgment. The International Council of Education Advisors uh, said we should provide a consistent support framework to teachers and then trust in their professionalism and that is exactly what we are doing. Um, in terms of uh, the data, this year's CFE levels data is more robust than last year's due to the quality assurance and moderation work that has been done in schools across Scotland and of course next year that consistency and reliability will be further enhanced by the use of standardised assessments in all schools and uh, let me repeat because I think this is the most uh, important point uh, the CFE levels data gives us the attainment levels of every child in Scotland at key stages in primary and secondary and provides detailed uh, data at all levels and that does help us to target action to raise attainment and close the attainment gap and that is what is most important about all of this. Ian Gray. The truth is, presiding officer, that educationalists and the First Minister's own statisticians have told her clearly that the literacy and numeracy survey was statistically valid to track national progress and that the new attainment data she is using simply is not nor ever will be. If this is really her priority, why won't she measure national progress properly by simply reintroducing the literacy and numeracy survey? Or is she afraid of what it might show? First Minister. The, the data that we are now publishing will tell all of us much, much more about the performance, not just of Scottish education generally, but of every child in the Scottish education system than we have ever had before. And as First Minister, and I know this is a view of the Education Secretary, when we are looking at the actions we need to take to improve attainment in our schools, then we want to have that comprehensive, robust data. SSLN did not give us that. As I think I've said previously, in this chamber. Uh, SSLN sometimes was based on samples in some schools uh, of as little as 12 pupils. We need comprehensive data and that's what the CFE levels data will give us and that is important. Question number six, Rhoda Grant. To ask the First Minister what contingency the contingencies the Scottish Government has put in place to deal with the effects of extreme winter weather on rural and remote areas. First Minister. We recognise the serious impact that extreme winter weather can have on rural and remote communities. Our dedicated resilience operation actively monitors all weather and flood alerts and can be activated at any time, any day of the year. Uh, indeed, last week during Storm Caroline, the Deputy First Minister convened the Resilience Committee to ensure that all appropriate support was in place. Uh, we also work closely with emergency services, local authorities, health boards, power companies and others to ensure that we understand any challenges happening on the ground across Scotland and that they can respond and coordinate appropriately at local level when any kind of emergency occurs. Rhoda Grant. Already this winter, constituents have contacted me with concerns about how the weather is impacting on health services. One gentleman reached Inverness and was waiting for his appointment at Rigmore Hospital when he was contacted by stagecoach to say his bus home 
had been cancelled due to bad weather. It cost him £200 to get home by taxi that night. Constituents in Caithness are all really concerned due to recent service changes forcing more of them to come to Inverness to access health services. Already this winter, the county has been cut off due to landslides on the rail line and road close, roads closed due to accidents. And sadly, this is a common occurrence. What's the First Minister doing to make sure my constituents don't face further trauma while accessing services this winter? First Minister. Well, uh, firstly, in, in relation to the specific constituent uh, case that Rhoda Grant uh, outlined there, if she, again, if she wants to provide us with details, uh, we'd be very happy to look into that. Uh, we cannot take away altogether uh, the impacts of bad weather during the winter. I think everybody understands that, but we do have to work to make sure uh, that everybody is pulling together to mitigate those impacts as much as possible. And that's what we do. That is what is done uh, at local level through resilience partnerships, which fully involve uh, NHS colleagues and it's what we coordinate at national level through our resilience uh, committee. Uh, in terms of some of the uh, wider issues in uh, relation to health uh, in the Highlands, uh, I understand uh, the, the issues and the concerns uh, that have been raised there, particularly about the number of outpatient visits that local people have to travel to Rigmore in uh, Inverness. For some, that's 100 uh, miles away. That's why NHS Highlands has been working uh, to develop long-term sustainable services across the Caithness area and uh, are reviewing the wider provision of hospital and adult community uh, services. So these are important issues uh, which we will continue uh, to work with others on. But uh, as I said at the outset of my answer, if there are particular constituency cases that Rhoda Grant uh, wishes the Health Secretary uh, or uh, other relevant ministers to look into, then please pass us the details of them. Question number seven, Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government has had with Police Scotland regarding tackling domestic abuse over the festive period. First Minister. Well, on Sunday the 10th of December, Police Scotland launched its anti-domestic abuse campaign. This campaign will run over the festive period uh, when sadly reports of domestic abuse increased by around a quarter. The campaign makes clear that Police Scotland will take all necessary action to deal with perpetrators of domestic abuse and I hope that the Member and the Chamber will, like the Scottish Government, fully support this important and necessary campaign. Michelle Ballantyne. I thank the First Minister for that answer and I do welcome her comments, particularly in the context of the Scottish borders, where there has been a 40% increase in the reported incidents of domestic abuse since 2008 and where more must be done to protect and support victims, that should be our utmost priority. Presiding officer, according to the Scottish Government's own figures, over 12,000 people were convicted of a crime of, with a domestic abuse aggravator in 2015-16, many of whom were given a short sentence. Given the utterly devastating impact of some domestic abuse, does the First Minister agree with me that abolishing prison sentences of less than a year, mm. allowing perpetrators to escape with little if any punishment or rehabilitation, is an appalling way to treat victims whose lives have been tortured by abuse, and that any government genuinely serious about eradicating domestic abuse would not adopt such a policy? First Minister. Uh, no, I, I don't uh, agree. Uh, with that because I don't really agree with the premise uh, on which that, that question was uh, based. Uh, in the interest of, of consensus on an issue where we should all try to come together and agree, uh, I, I do think that Michelle Ballantyne is right to say that protecting and supporting victims should be our absolute top priority. I know she's particularly interested in the Scottish Borders and I hope she will agree with me that Scottish Borders Domestic Abuse Advocacy Service is a great example of innovative uh, partnership work. Uh, and uh, if an increase in reports of domestic abuse through the advocacy service or indeed uh, through the police shows an increased level of confidence in victims to come forward and report incidents, then that is something that we should uh, welcome. Uh, and of course, the Scottish Government funding of that service in the Scottish Borders uh, has totaled 585,000 since its launch in 2012. Now, uh, let me get to perhaps uh, the less consensual part uh, of, of my answer. Uh, Michelle Ballantyne said we were abolishing short sentences. That, that's not actually uh, the case. Uh, we are looking to create a presumption against short sentences. Uh, and there are many people working in the criminal justice field who think uh, that is the, the right thing to do to reduce reoffending. 
But of course, uh, deciding on the, the sentence in any individual case is always a matter for the judge who hears that case. It's not a matter for me as First Minister, and it's not a matter for the Scottish Government or indeed any politician in this chamber. Uh, so having a situation where ultimately the decision on sentencing rests with judges is absolutely the right and proper one. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to move on to members' business. It's a very busy members' business on bank closures, but we'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.